Thank you very much, buddy, and good morning. It's, it's great to see so many people here so early. In just three seasons, Al Bagnoli has directed a masterful turnaround of the Pennsylvania football program. After finishing 73 in his seven and three in his first season at Penn in 1992, the Quakers have posted back-to-back 10 and 0 seasons and will begin the 1995 season with a 21 game winning streak. Before coming to Penn, Coach Bagnoli spent 10 seasons as the head coach at Union College, was the AFCA College Division II Region I Coach of the Year four times there. Union appeared in the NCAA Division III playoffs six times in his 10, season, 10 seasons and played in the Stag Bowl in 1989. The title of his presentation today is Penn's Multiple Defense, Keeping Your Opponents Guessing. Ladies and gentlemen, a gentleman who runs a great football program, does a tremendous job in every aspect, Al Bagnoli. Thank you. you know, I've often said that you really know who your friends are at 7.45 in the morning. I'm glad to see so many people here. I left my uh, room this morning. I had a little bit of a scare. I got into the uh, elevator, and believe it or not, uh, we got stuck. We went up and down about three or four different times, and I was with an older gentleman with a cane, and there was actually some panic, but uh, luckily we were able to stop the elevator and get off and jump on another one, cause, or else this could have been quite embarrassing. It's a uh, real privilege to be up here. I've been very fortunate that uh, I've had great players and great coaches working with me and playing for me. Our defensive staff is uh, consistent of Mike Toop, our defensive coordinator and inside linebacker coach, whom you'll hear in a couple minutes. Rick Flanders, who is our secondary coach. Ray Priori is our defensive end coach. Jim Schaefer is our defensive line coach. And we have two limited earning coaches, Mark Shimolinski and Jim Wilcon. And all are very, very talented in their own right. Extremely hard working group. And they do a great job of teaching and implementing the things that we want taught. Now we've been at Penn, as Peter has mentioned, for three seasons. I think the thing that we have for those three seasons has been a very, very consistent defensive football team. I think it's one of the reasons why we were able to win as many games as we have. And it's one of the reasons why we were able to be the only team in Ivy League history to go back to back unbeaten seasons. When we took over that program three years ago, we did what every coach has to do. We kind of took inventory of the entire program. And we didn't limit it just to defensive personnel, but we looked at the facilities and the budget and administration, the support groups, and obviously we looked at the personnel. When we looked at our defensive personnel, we tried to study that very hard, and we came up with certain characteristics. We found that our defensive line was athletic, they had good feet, they ran pretty well, but were undersized. We found that our linebacking core, both our inside kids and our outside kids, were very talented and certainly were big playmakers. And when we looked at our secondary, we found that they ran pretty well, but again, were a little bit undersized. So we were trying to take those variables and evaluate what we had defensively. Then we turned around and we tried to assess the strength of the league and what we thought we had to defend. And we're in a very wide open, balanced, multiple league. Um, our league presented us everything from the multi-flex wing T concept to the eye bone triple option to a no back, one back passing attack. So we basically ran the entire gamut of what we had to try to de defend. And back then we had the additional problem of not having spring football. So we were trying to implement what we wanted in and doing that <clears throat> basically just with preseason. We only had one day of spring football at that time. <clears throat> so I thought that we were going to have our hands full, and I thought we had to be very careful in terms of what we put in there, and we had to make sure that it was sound, we had to make sure that we can teach it, but it was also complex enough that when we faced this multi-flex, or we faced the eye bone, or we faced whatever, we were going to have enough things in our package to try to stop them. When we finally started putting things in, you know, we went and, and, and we were very conscious of the old adage of how you do things and, and why you do things are probably every bit as important as what you do. And, you know, I realize that there's an awful lot of different ways you can defense people and awful lots of different systems that you can use and they certainly have had success on all different fronts, but I wanted what was right for us, not basically what was right for, 
Yale or Harvard or Penn State or Syracuse or whomever, but I wanted what was right for us, what we thought was going to work based on what we had to defend. And we are very conscious of the hows and whys as well as the whats. And I think you have to assess your own situation and you have to try to get yourself in a situation where you feel very comfortable in what you're teaching. And I think that's something that we spent a lot of time with. Once we put everything together in terms of our strengths and the opponents, uh, you know, we basically went into and just tried to get some simple philosophical principles and premises. And basically those were my beliefs on how we should play defense in terms of how I wanted things implemented, how I wanted things taught. And I think, you know, myself as a head coach, I think you want things communicated to your staff and you want things emphasized and I think you have to declare what you want. And I also think you have to express what your level of expectations are. And you have to make sure that those level of expectations are understood by everybody. And what is an acceptable level of performance? Once we did that, we came up with five or six simple premises that we used to, to build our defensive philosophy. Number one, we honestly believe that big games are won on defense. And that if you're going to win a big game, whether you're talking about a national championship game, whether you're talking about an Ivy League title, whether you're talking about a conference championship, that the big games are going to be decided on defense. And that the bigger the game, the better your defensive teams had to play. And that's something that's stuck with us for the last three years. And it has something to do, once you make that philosophical statement, it has something to do with what you do with your personnel. And our philosophy has always been, we're going to put our very best kids on defense and start off with that premise because we honestly think that in the big games it's the defensive team that's going to win. And we wanted our kids to really understand this and I think we spent an awful lot of time on that kind of mentality with our kids. The second thing was we felt you can gain consistency through defense. You know, we're in a geographic area in the Northeast where sometimes the weather is a little volatile and you have some those uncontrollable weather things, and I think the one constant you can have is that you can play good defense week in, week out, and that can keep you in some games, regardless of what the weather conditions are. It's something that you should be able to depend on week in and week out. Next, we had to get our players to play hard. And I think as a football coach, that probably is the greatest compliment that someone can, can give you is when you come off the field saying, God, your kids really play hard. And it's, it's a mentality that I think you have to spend some time with and you have to coach and you have to teach. And it doesn't matter how good your athletes are. You know, you don't need Division I athletes to get your kids to play hard. You don't need blue chip kids. It's a mentality. There's no reason why they can't run to the football. There's no reason why they can't gang tackle. There's no reason why they can't play reckless. But it's something from the coaching staff, from the head coach right on down, that I think you have to set the environment to make sure that you're getting that kind of play. But you have to get your kids to play hard, and I think that's one of the things that we've been successful at. It always hasn't been pretty, but for the three years, week in and week out, we've gotten our kids to play hard and they've made some plays. We wanted to be multiple enough to keep people off balance, you know, obviously because of all the different things we had to defend, and at the same time, you know, we had to keep our technique somewhat limited and simple, because unless you're decidedly better, we didn't think we can stay in a base defense and try to beat everybody in the league that we had to beat. Lastly, we had to decide on exactly what type of defense you wanted to be, whether you were going to be a high risk, or aggressive, a pressure or blitz orientated, or you're going to be more of a safe, you know, the bend but don't break, conservative style of attack. And I think in certain situations, both have been very successful. And we as a coach and staff had to answer what was right for us. Once we did everything, you know, we developed a defense that I thought was multiple, that had our players moving on virtually every snap, which, which helped us from the size perspective and what we can do well, that can pressure people, that can defend. And uh, to get into this a little bit further, at, at this time I'd like to introduce Mike Toop, our defensive coordinator, will take you through the actual X and O's. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Michael. Thanks, Coach. I guess uh, the first thing is why do we like multiple fronts? And, and really, 
the thing that we like about the fronts, well, the reason we use multiple fronts is that, you know, the game of football is, is really a guessing game. You know, are they going to run the ball, throw the ball? Are they coming after us, blitzing, are they playing a base front? We feel that the more times you can make the offense guess what kind of front you're going to be in and what look you're going to throw at them, it, try, it, it really kind of levels the game out a little bit. We think that uh, if we can change up looks and not just come out in a 5-2 and then come out in a 4-3 look, but, but stem from a 5-2 two or four, three, when the quarterback's under the center, it gives us maybe not an advantage, but maybe it levels the field a little bit as far as taking the offense advantage away from knowing where to go and where to attack you. We basically run three different fronts. We run a base 5-2, which is what Coach brought down from Union when I was with him at Union College. This was really our base front. It still is our base front. I'm not going to, you know, I don't really think that we do anything very innovative at all, but this is, you know, this is our base package, a base Oki. I think the thing that we've done, or one element of our defensive package that we didn't do at Union, is really what we call our 6 1 front. Now, the thing that we do is we don't personnel substitute. We run our 6 1 front and our 5 2 front with the same people on the field. We will line up in a 5-2, and we'll take our dime, and in the middle, during a cadence, we'll take him, and he will shift and jump up in a tight end's face. So I think, you know, it gives us a little bit of, a, of an advantage. Other reasons why we use a multiple front, we have a lot of respect for the people that we're lining up against and playing. You know, people know how to go after you. They know how to spread the field different formations, they know what your weaknesses are in a 6-1 front and a 5-2. We feel that not only can you be a little bit more aggressive defensively with multiple fronts, but I think the bottom line, if things are going bad, you're going to have more answers. You know, people are going to know how to go after a 5-2, where the soft spots are, where the bubbles are over the guard, or maybe they're going to run outside veer, you know, at the tackles with option game. You want to be able to have some answers if you can't make adjustments or personnel-wise, you can't match up. Obviously, being able to run a couple different fronts, it expands your game plan on defense. The third front that we, we do a little bit of, and I'll be real honest with you, it's really a minimal amount of our game plan, is our 4-4 look. And I would say, we do this, well, this year we averaged only three snaps a game on defense in a 4-4. Our 5-2 front, we run 60% of the time in a normal down and distance situation. Our 6-1 front, we probably run close to 40% in normal down and distance. Now, one thing that we've been able to do with our 6-1 front is we've taken it and we've expanded it where we have the ability to put what we call our dime weak. We can put them to the split end side. Or, as you saw on the other overlay, we can put him to the strong side or to the tight end. The third element is that we can actually choice the dime and put him strong or weak, tight end, split end, based on formation. We can actually choice it, and I'll get into that in a, in a second as to how we've been able to evolve through this. Now, I don't think that we do anything particular special. I think the biggest thing that we look to do is, is, as Coach said in our game plan, we like to try and dictate the tempo of the game with defense. I think we've obviously been very fortunate. You know, we, we only averaged 66 snaps a defense a game this year. I think is a tremendous testimony to what our offense is able to do with the ball as far as being able to hold it and keep it out of the other guy's hands. Our 5-2 front, we play with three down people, two tackles, what we call a mic man. We play with two ends, which are outside linebackers. In our terminology, we call them ends. We play with two inside linebackers, and we play with a four-deep secondary. 
Now, one thing, or well, the biggest consideration we had as far as implementing the, and trying to expand the package were, were two things, really, and that was teaching and practice time. How are we going to take a 5-2 package and then try and put in a 6-1 package and, and then go to a 4-4 package without adding a lot of new teaching and, and new learning? And then the other thing is, when are you going to be able to practice all this? And really what we did was we took the, our base front to 5-2 and, and we have three down kids. And with our three down kids, we taught it. We don't teach in terms of 5-2 and 6-1 more than we teach in terms of alignment. The front, when we say 50, it tells them where they're going to line up. When we say 60, it tells them where they're going to line up. So we teach in terms of technique or, or really alignment. Each one of our down kids is going to have to learn how to play in an outside technique, a, a head up technique, an inside technique, and a gap technique, regardless of the front they're in. You know, obviously we'll eagle and, and do those types of things in our 50 package. We also do the same thing in our 6-1 front, where we can take our mic man and we'll shade him on the center at times and do some of those things. But from a standpoint of teaching, Jim Schaefer, our defensive line coach, he only worries about alignment and this is, these are the techniques that you use when you're outside, head up, inside. The other thing that we do with regards to teaching is that we, do, we only teach in terms of movements or line movements. Each one of our down kids is required to execute a line movement where he's going to move half a man, move to a gap, or move a full man. So for, existence, for example, the mic man will move or slant to a shade. He'll be required to slant to a gap, and he'll be taught a technique where he's required to slant or move a full man. Each one of our down kids has to know how to execute those three moves. So when we went to our 6-1 front, all we're doing is changing their alignment and their leverage a little bit. And Shafe has taught these kids at this point in time, they, it really makes no difference what front they're in, it's where they're aligned on the person. And basically what the huddle call is with regards to are we slanting the front or are we playing base? Now, we have the ability in all of our fronts, and, and really we do quite a bit of movement. I mean, our three down kids in our base package, at least two kids are going to be moving every snap. We don't sit down and we don't play a base five and read. We're just not good enough to do that. Our 6-1 front, we do a little bit more straight read, but we also have the ability to slant our front in the 6-1 as well. Our 4-4 package will slant four people. So from a standpoint of teaching and new learning for the kids, with our down kids, it wasn't a lot of new learning from package to package. Our defensive ends. It, it, you know, we only pl you, see, you only see two E's up here. We don't play with a drop kid and a rush kid. We don't play with a boundary kid and a field kid. We don't play with an anchor. I mean, we just play with a left and a right. Now, that, that asks your kids to do quite a bit from a physical standpoint, and we understand that, but I think that's one reason why we've been able to have a little bit more success. We play with the left and right, and those kids have to be able to play in the tight end's face and be able to walk away and, and play in coverage. And, and we like that concept simply because it creates what we feel the ability to disguise as far as walking a kid off and then bringing them up on a line of scrimmage and sending them. Uh, you know, we don't feel that it's, it's a great advantage that, well, you know, now he's going to be able to get all these sacks. But I think what it does is maybe once or twice a game, if you can walk a kid and disguise a look, maybe they're going to make a wrong line call. Okay, and again, if, if you can get it back to the guessing game, I think it evens the field up a little bit for you defensively, and maybe you can make a big play. So with regards to our ends, we play the left and right. Again, from package to package, it has absolutely no bearing on them at all. Again, it's all based on their alignment, and then basically they're taking their reads off tight ends, offensive linemen, and backfield. So there is no new learning for our defensive ends. Everything's based on alignment and whether or not they're a rush kid or a drop kid based on the which way we're slanting our front and what coverage we're playing. 
Our secondary, we play with a 4D. And when we go from front to front, it has no bearing for them. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I turn around to Rick Flan and say, hey, you, you cover those guys back there. I mean, all they worry about is coverage. Now, a major consideration we had, well, the only consideration we had for the secondary going from a 5-2 to a 6-1 was making sure we could marry up our coverages so that we didn't have to put in a different coverage for each package. And we were able to do that. We're basically a quarter-quarter half team and a man-to-man -man team defensively. And we double-digit everything based on formation. So when we go from a 5-2 to a 6-1, all we have to do is flip the coverages and everything marries up. So from a standpoint of teaching in the secondary, it was very consistent and there was no new learning for the secondary. Where it became, becomes, or the position where there's a lot of new learning is at the linebacker position. And you know, maybe people are gonna question, do you want what's probably gonna be your two most aggressive kids on the field, your two linebackers, do you want them to do a lot of thinking? And if, and if you knew who our linebackers were, you'd say that's, it's not very intelligent at all, but, but it's the one position where those kids have to do new learning. Okay? We play with two inside backers. We play with what we call a backer and a dime. Now, our linebacker position or our backer position, from a physical standpoint, he's always going to be a second-level player. So physically, when we go from a 5-2 to a 6-1, it's not going to be different for him at all. What is different, obviously, is when you go from a 50 linebacker to a 6-1, I think that's asking a kid to do quite a bit. Now, yesterday, I listened to Coach Stallings, and he said, you know, the reason why, you know, I'm up here, and, and again, the reason why I'm here is that we've won 21 games in a row, and, and we've got kids that make plays. I mean, Coach Stallings said, you know, players make plays. And this kid right here, I mean, I've been in Penn for three years, and all three years, both inside linebackers have been all Ivy. You know, this particular past year, eight out of our starting 11 made all conference. So we've got some kids that can play. Uh, you know, this kid right here was the MVP of the league. So we got some kids with some different plumbing, I think, a little bit. But, uh, our inside linebacker or the backer spot, he's going to have to be a 50 linebacker and he's going to have to be a 6-1 linebacker. I think, and, and where it becomes difficult from a learning or a mental standpoint from him, for him, will be you know, his gap responsibility from front to front. Because we do a lot of slanting in our 5-2, you know, he has to know which gap he's going to be responsible for if we're slanting the front this way. and the ball goes this way, he has to know what gap he's got to look to step to first, and if it goes opposite, he's got to know which, if he's a cutback player, and those types of things. And that takes a little bit of time for him. And then you throw at him the fact that now he's a middle linebacker in a 6-1 scheme, and he's a two-gap player. Now, that's asking a kid to do a, little, to do a lot, and we understand that. And he's going to make mistakes. But the bottom line, or the reason why we, we don't, I, I feel we can do it, is that you're taking what should be your most instinctive player on defense. So his instincts or natural ability as far as being able to read a play should compensate from a mental standpoint. I mean, he's just going to line up and play at times. The only thing that you really have to emphasize is the option game where you've got to make sure he knows who he's playing. The dime position is really the position that requires a lot. It's probably the toughest position in our defense to play from a standpoint where he's going to play a 50 linebacker inside and then when we go to a 6-1 look he's got a line, we take him and we throw him up and put him on an in, in an inside technique in a tight end's face and that's asking a kid to do a lot physically. It also, we also ask him to do the most learning or we require him to do the most learning from a standpoint of what front, where he's lining up. Coverage wise We've been able to, you know, and, and Rick's been able to, to build our coverages into the defense where, with the exception of two coverages, when we go to our 6-1, it's consistent for both linebackers. When we go to a 6-1 front, there are two coverages where the backer and the dime switch responsibilities. Okay. So we've been fortunate to build our package where there's not a tremendous amount of learning.
The dime is the kid that has to do the most. And, and again, I mean, again, I'm up here because we've got kids right now physically that, that can do that. And again, you're asking a kid to do a lot, but, but we can. Why do we use each front? You know, if you talk to some offensive people in our league, they're going to tell you that when it's a run situation, you're probably going to see us in a 5-2 front most of the time. If it's second and medium or we can, you know, get them off schedule, you'll see us in a 6-1. We feel the advantage of, as Coach said, I, you know, we're not real big. I mean, Cornell's offensive line averaged 280 pounds, and my nose guard is 5'11", 240, and, you know, uh, that's not real good, and we're not going to sit there and play in the base. So we do quite a bit of slanting and moving around. Our 6-1 front, we feel by alignment, is going to make the quarterback sit there and say, are they coming or are they not? Just by alignment, it's a pressure, pressure package for us. The 4-4 front, why we use it, more so it gives us the ability, you know, if you look at our offense, we do all one back, two tight ends, three wide outs, we spread the field and we balance the field up. And we like to try and spread people out. I think we're fortunate because Chuck Pure, our offensive coordinator, when we go against him in preseason and, and in the spring, he knows how to go after us pretty good, and he makes us balance up. Well, a 4-4 obviously is a balance front for us. A lot of people go in double pro looks with two tight ends, two wide outs. We feel now you can, have, you can get four on three in the guard center box. You can get four on three guard center tackle box. So people are going to try and balance us up a little bit, which when you run on a 5-2 and you're tilted, now maybe we'll shift and we'll go to a 4-4. So those are, you know, those are the three fronts that we basically play in our normal down and distance. And all three fronts are consistent where we have three down people. In a 50, we've got three down people. In a 6-1, you've got three down people. In the 4-4, we've got three down people. So teaching-wise, we feel that it hasn't been a real burden for the kids at all. We've been able to, to try and take this concept and expand it to our nickel package. And, and again, the, our biggest consideration was teaching and, and, and practice time. And our base our base front in our nickel package is what we call our pro. Now, obviously, passing situations, we're going to get our best four kids up front as far as rushing the passer. We're going to get our best defenders in the secondary. And what we do is we take what we call a nickel back, and we're going to put him in a game, and, and it's, it's an extra defensive back. But from a standpoint of teaching, our pro front equals our 6-1 front. We play with a dime. His alignment considerations are exactly the same in the pro front as they are in our 6-1 front. So there's no new learning for him when we go to the nickel package. The, the only kid who has to do new learning now in our nickel package, or our pro package here, our pro front, is the nickel. And he's usually going to be a corner, a defensive back, and you know, the corners are lying on number one, and that's all they got to know anyway. So now they have to know that they're playing the curl instead of just the deep outside quarter or something like that. So, you know, that's not too taxing for them. The other thing that we did was, you know, and this was really our bread and butter the first two years we were at Penn in long yardage situations. What we did this year was we took the pro front and we expanded it to try and give some different looks. Again, we wanted to be a little bit multiple where, you know, people knew in long yardage situations we'd basically be in a 4-3 in a look and they're going to know how to go after you and how to spread you out and how to attack you. So we wanted to change it up a little bit and, and keep the same personnel on the field, but now give it a different alignment. So what we came up with what we call a red, and it's the same people, but now it's more of a 5-2 look. Now the difference between our normal down and distance and our nickel package is we only play with two down people. 
We play with two tackles. You know, we don't play with the Mike man anymore. The Mike man technically comes out of the game and is replaced by a nickel. The end position is the same. We may have different personnel based on pass rush ability, but the end position is the same in our normal down and distant fronts and our long yardage fronts. So our red front is more of a 5-2 look. The last front that we've utilized in long yardage situations is what we call our white front. And basically, the only thing the white front does is now, the difference between red and white is we're going to rush only three people in white and we're dropping eight. Or we're going to rush four or five out of white, but it's going to be different people. We're going to drop one of our ends. Again, the only person in a long yardage package that has any new learning is the nickel. For everyone else, everything's going to be the same. and There's a lot of carryover as far as teaching. So that hasn't been a problem for us. I think we've been able to manage it pretty well from a standpoint of budgeting practice time. I think the only thing that we've, we've had to do was take the inside linebacker position. And in actuality, what we've done is we've split it into two separate positions. So we, and I'm fortunate to have you know, people like Jimmy Wilcon where I can take the middle linebacker when we're working in the 6 1, and he's going to take the dime position, and, and we can work that way. I guess the, the thing that, or to illustrate a little bit, the success we've been able to do, if we break it down, what I've been able to do is break it down. This past year, we played 66, 66 snaps a game on defense. And we played our 5 2 front 31 times. For an average of 31 snaps a game, we played our 6 1 front 19 times. We averaged two snaps a game in a 4 4. We played our pro front eight snaps a game. We played our red front, two snaps a game. We played our white front, two snaps a game. We were short yardage, one snap a game. Average one snap a goal line a game. So we, you know, that's been breakdown for us. When or how, what determines when we're gonna use each front, that's basically dependent upon three things. First of all, it's personnel. You know, it's what we look for really, and you watch all that film, we look to see where we can get a mismatch or where we can get one of our better kids, or what front we can match up a kid on someone we can gain an advantage. That's probably the determining factor of when we're going to use each front during a game. The second thing that we take into consideration is self-scout. All right, you know, you get to the seventh week of the season, you know, people got six or seven games on you based on trade and all that, and uh, what we do is we self-scout so we know what films our opponents have and we break that down, so they're going to see us in a long yardage situation in a three-game breakdown. Maybe we were in a, in a pro front 12 times, and we are only in, in white one snap. So we'll, we'll factor that in, where they're, they're going to expect us to be in a certain front. So we take the self-scout and feed that in. And then the other thing, obviously, is, is the opponent's tendencies. What are they doing in down a distance formationally? Are they running the ball, passing the ball? You know. So those are the three things that we do which isn't you know, anything more than anyone else does, but, but that de de determines when we're going to use each front. You know, once we get into the middle of the season, I think you know, we're going to be in the even front maybe more often than not in second and long yardage situations. So in the seventh game of the season, I know this year, all of a sudden, long yardage situations, we were just going to stay in our 5-2 front because they were expecting us to be in something else. Or we will stem from one front to another. Again, we'll line up in a 6-1, and during cadence, we're going to shift back to our 5-2 or vice versa. And we can do that with our 4-4 as well. So again, it's, it basically is a guessing game. What we look to do is try and make the offense guess as much as possible. Our goal is to make the, make the quarterback try and determine what you're doing coverage-wise and front-wise if he's going to try and run the ball after he takes a snap rather than prior to the snap. The more often, the more you can do that, I think the, the better, you, better chance you have of making some plays on defense. You know, just uh, finishing up here, I just want to thank uh, Coach Bagnoli. I think I'm real fortunate 
to work for someone like Al Bagnoli. Uh, first of all, he's a defensive guy, which helps because he said before that he puts the better kids on defense, and I think that's, that's true. Um, so I'm lucky in that respect. And also we have you know, our defensive staff. I just want to point him out right now. Rick Flanders is our secondary coach. Jim Schaefer is our defensive line coach. Ray Priori, who's our, who's our defensive end coach, uh, is our recruiting coordinator. And we got a bunch of kids coming in this weekend, so he's home getting ready for that. And we have uh, Mark Shimolinski, who's our video coordinator and helps Rick with the secondary, and Jimmy Wilcon, who helps me and, and Ray with the inside linebackers and defensive ends. So uh, I think the biggest thing that we look to do as far as coaches, we don't, we're smart enough to realize that it's not coaching that wins games. It's, it's players that win the games. The biggest thing that we have to do is make sure we communicate well enough and teach the techniques and fundamentals of playing each front well enough where kids are going to be in a position to make plays. All we look to do defensively is put your kid in a position to make a play. If you can do that, you know, you've got a fighting chance. Okay. Thank you.